Hi, and welcome to chapter two, financial markets and institutions. So in this chapter, we're gonna be talking about the capital al allocation process, financial markets, financial institutions, stock markets and returns, and stock market efficiency. So first let's talk about how capital is transferred between savers and borrowers. So basically we have three possibilities, direct transfers, investment banks, and financial intermediaries. So let's look at this chart. <clears throat> so in this chart, we have savers and we have business. So in the direct transfer, uh, as shown in this top section here, occurs when a business sells the stocks directly to saver, stocks and bonds. So through dividend reinvestment programs, um, through uh, certain corporate websites, you can buy stocks and bonds directly from business. But this is less common because of the hassle of the paperwork and the hassle of taxes. And it, it, most people would find this sort of a little clunky to buy direct from the business. So in that case, we can go to investment banks. So in the transfer through an investment bank, such as you know Morgan Stanley is a big one, um, they're gonna underwrite new issues. So they basically, an investment bank is what businesses go to to create new bonds and new stocks. And the company will you know sell its stocks and bonds to the investment bank, and which in turn is gonna turn around and sell these same securities to the savers. Uh, and this way, they can pass through the savings money to the companies. And the companies in, in this number two, uh, just like in number one as well, they get direct, they'll get the direct benefit from these dollars that the investment bank when they create these new securities so they you know they call it a sale proceeds is what they're the business is to get from this primary market transaction now in the third in this third area the financial intermediary this you know funds can also transfer through this such as a bank an insurance company a mutual fund and they're going to obtain obtain this, the money from the savers in exchange for securities that they'll buy uh, from the businesses. Now, you know, in this particular case, um, you go to the bank, you deposit your money, and maybe you receive a certificate of deposit. The, thus, the intermediaries will create new forms of capital, such as certificates of deposit that a bank could create that you could buy from them, which could be more safer. Uh, than stocks or bonds. So they can also, these financial intermediaries can also create other types of products that may not actually need to be tied directly to a business. So those are three ways that money can be transferred from savers to businesses and financial intermediaries such as banks can create special products, also mutual funds can create special products to sort of um, give savers an enhanced ability to earn a return on their money. And this is good for businesses because they need the capital to build the company, invest in growing the company, acquiring another company, in some cases, maybe stock buybacks. And also, you know, money will flow to government. So government can be uh, funding new projects and, you know, uh, new programs. So this is how primarily most of the capital moves around the economy. And typically, Individuals are the biggest savers, and governments are big demanders of funds to help, you know, develop the uh, country. Okay, so let's move on to. Uh, so speaking of the economy, a well-functioning economy, capital flows efficiently from those who supply the capital, the savers, to those who demand it, the government and businesses. So like I said before, suppliers of capital, most likely individuals, um, and some institutions with excessive funds, these groups are gonna save their money, look for a rate of return that they want to hopefully beat inflation or more, depending on how much risk they're willing to take. And the demanders of funds, individual institutions who need to raise funds to finance their opportunities, you know, uh, these groups are willing to pay a rate of return to compensate people who want to lend them money. And, you know, and typically 
you know, governments are some of the biggest borrowers of funds. And even, even some of the funds have been borrowed greatly in the last number of years for stock buybacks, which is, you know, companies see buying their own stock as a worthwhile investment and they're willing to pay a return on bonds to be able to do that. Okay. So what is a market? So basically when we talk about a market, it's, it, you know, you have this basic concept from just going out to the store. It's some sort of venue where goods and services can be exchanged. It could be a grocery store or it could be a stock exchange. But a financial market like a stock exchange is where individuals and organizations want to borrow funds are brought together uh, with those who have a surplus of funds to lend. And it's all in the name of developing a return. Now, let's talk about a couple of these markets. Um, so these, these types of markets, physical assets, financial assets, uh, spots and futures, money and capital, primary and secondary, public and private. So let's talk about each of these and just kind of discuss their importance. So physical markets, also known as tangible, maybe also known as real asset markets are for products that might sound familiar to you. Automobiles, corn, uh, computers, machinery, um, you know, financial asset markets, on the other hand, are dealing with stocks and bonds and mortgages. Um, financial markets also deal with derivatives uh, whose value are derived from another asset, such as options. Now, if we talk about what's the difference between the spot and the futures market, so the spot market is markets and assets that are, uh, that are for sale right now on the spot, delivery literally within a few days. So spot market, it's on the spot. Just this is the price for buying this right now. And the futures market are markets where people agree to buy or sell an asset at some point in the future. Uh, so say you're a farmer, and you may want to enter into a contract today to agree to sell your corn um, six months from now at a certain price. Now you lock that in. So no matter what happens to the corn prices, you already made a deal to sell your corn in the future at a certain price. So a futures market helps you to lock in prices that you're, will, you're willing and know you can profit at. So airlines also do this for fuel. So they may put into more, they may engage in future contracts to lock in a fuel price for the next six months or so. So that way they can generate and put together the cost of plane tickets, knowing how much they're going to pay in the future. So very handy uh, instruments, these future contracts. Now let's talk about money versus uh, capital markets. So money markets are short term. Highly liquid, highly liquid debt markets uh, with typically a life less than a year. So any type of financial instrument that is has a short term life typically is considered to be a lot safer and pay a lot lower interest. Where the capital markets are the long term markets. So these are the markets where bonds and stocks live. And you know some of these markets like the New York Stock Exchange, um, the NASDAQ, um, and this is where these longer term assets are traded. Okay, so let's talk about the primary versus the secondary markets. So the primary markets, you know, they're the markets to raise new capital, such as IPOs or sell brand new bonds. And this is where companies will get the proceeds of that. The secondary market are markets that exist so these securities, stocks, and bonds can be traded back and forth by investors. Think of it like the uh, video game industry. You could go into a primary market and buy new video games. And then when you're done with it, you can go and sell your used game and the store will take that used game and sell it to somebody else. So the software companies only generate a profit when you buy the video game new. 
if you bring it back to the store and they resell it, or you you resell through eBay or some other secondary market, the the manufacturer or the software company doesn't receive any part of the money when the item is resold. This is also the case for textbooks. You can buy brand new textbooks and the publisher gets money from the brand new textbooks, or you could buy a used textbook, which the publisher will not get money for, only the bookstore will profit from that. It's one of the reasons tech, new textbook prices are so high is to compensate for the fact that it's gonna, the textbook could have a two to three uh, transfer life in a secondary market. Okay, so let's move on to uh, public and private markets. So um, a private market is where transactions can occur between two or more people um, that are not open for the public to know what's happening. So it's a private transaction uh, where you know a rich individual may go to a company and make a private investment that um, can happen outside of the markets. Now, a public market, this is where standardized contracts are traded in an organized exchange, such as a stock market, an options market, commodities market, or a, a bond market. Also bank loans and private debt uh, placements with insurance companies are examples of some private market transaction because those transactions are private, they can keep their structure in a manner which is relevant to the specific parties engaging in them. Uh, by contrast, the securities in a public market such as you know, common stocks and bonds are held by a large number of individuals and these securities have fairly standard contractual features that make it easy to trade them back and forth uh, when you want to sell them. Okay, moving on. Uh, the important, what is the importance of financial markets? So a well-functioning financial market is going to facilitate this flow of capital, you know, from investors to users of capital. And this is important because you want the money that people save to have a decent return, to have an opportunity for a great return. And you also want people who have companies or want to start companies or grow companies, the ability to borrow money so they could grow their company, build headquarters, build factories, build websites, and hire people and produce products and innovations that the overall populations are going to enjoy. Uh, so these markets are going to provide savers a return for their money and users of capital get to finance their investing investment projects. So it works very well together and keeps the economy growing moving forward. So these well-functioning financial markets are going to promote stronger and, um, and more consistent economic growth. So economies you know, who have these well-developed markets perform better than economies with poor functioning financial markets where companies really don't have access to the funds they need to grow their companies. So this has been you know why so many governments really work hard to make sure that they can develop a a very functioning well-oiled financial markets to help their um, businesses move ahead quickly now uh, before we get into derivatives a couple of things i want to say about financial markets you know, there's been a lot of change in the financial markets over, say, the last um, 10, 15 years that, you know, computers have been becoming a bigger part of buying and selling securities, increasing the speed at which securities can be traded. Um, so this high frequency trading is how firms could you know, represent very, you know, very significant fraction of like the total trading of a given day. So you look at the given day, <clears throat> a lot of it can be done by these high frequency computer trades, which has really changed the landscape of the volume of, of increasing the volume of shares being traded. So, you know, technology has a way of, you know, greatly enhancing and affecting financial markets. So even you know changing the way that people pay for transactions, you know cash is becoming um, not as common as people use debit cards and credit cards and cell phones, Apple Pay and Google Pay, and people are you know and PayPal. Um, 
People are making transfers with Zelle and, and other types of money transfer programs uh, that you can you know, send money to individuals directly uh, through, your, through your bank account on your phone. There's been such enhancements as Bitcoin, which is a, you know, an artificial uh, currency that's a, um, a not a physical currency. So these changes in technology allow for more versatility in the financial markets, but sometimes can lead to additional risks. And things like Bitcoin have been very volatile. And this is in, in addition to you know, the globalization of financial markets and the cooperation of international level of different governments and the flow of money and, 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 and making these financial markets seamless between countries um, has really changed the, the global aspect of the growth of economies. You know, and as you know, innovations have taken place, so as we move into derivatives, you know, these uh, derivatives, you know, can be used to reduce risk and also sometimes increase risk. So there are parties that want to reduce risk that are, that are selling their commodities, oil, wheat, corn, sugar. And there are, there are businesses like cereal manufacturers and airlines that want to minimize the risk of using these commodities. And there are some financial traders that want to highly leverage their risk by using derivatives. So it's, a derivative is just an artificial contract where they derive the value of the contract from another asset. And that could really be anything, gold, stocks, bonds, um, anything you want, because it is a contract. So, you know, when we say hedge, it's to reduce risk. So businesses, financial managers like to hedge their currency exposures. They, they like to hedge their commodity usage, or say they're using oil, large amounts of oil or jet fuel. So when um, profits fall, when the dollar loses its value, uh, they can purchase currency futures uh, that will do well when the dollar weakens. So they can also, if they know they're getting cer a certain amount of currency in, they can hedge their position in that currency. So even if the currency weakens, the future contract will make a profit to, to help minimize the impact of the change in currency. Now, as far as increasing risk, speculators can use derivatives uh, to bet on a direction of oil or stocks, interest rates, exchange rates, uh, commodities prices. Those are the corn, wheat, uh, things like that. So these transactions can produce very high returns because you're so leveraged in these, in these uh, uh, future contracts that great amount of profits can be produced if you know, if you guess in the right direction. And that's going to be why they're so risky is because you, you may only have to put one or 2% down on the size of the contract. So you can get a million dollar contract by putting a thousand dollars down, which is highly leveraged. And that's why the average investor has no access to future markets. Generally future markets are only accessible by large corporations, large financial institutions, hedge funds, mutual funds, things like this. Um, it's a very, you know, it's one of the things that, just looking ahead for a second, one of the things that, you know, can make finance very complicated. You know, so certainly, you know, derivatives have created things like credit default swaps and credit default swap, you know, futures, options, forwards, and swaps are all different types of derivatives. And credit default swaps are you know, contracts that offer protection against the default of a particular security. So say a bank wants to protect itself against the default of one of its borrowers, the bank can enter it into a credit uh, default swap, would they basically agree to regular payments from another financial institution? In return, a financial institution agrees to insure the bank against losses that could occur uh, if the borrower defaults. So it's a way of spreading out the risks now, and the, uh, with this credit default swaps we can think of as a CDS. So as the market grew uh, quickly once these were developed to over a trillion dollars in 2001 and then 60 trillion dollars by 2007. And that was sometimes they point to these as one of the things that provided fuel to the Great Recession that occurred. Um, now. 
derivatives, although they can be scary and create these excessive risks, but most of the time derivatives can be used to reduce that risk. Uh, so, th so for those people who are fearing rising costs of oil or wheat, they can go ahead and buy those future contracts now at a lower price. So if the price changes dramatically, they have it locked in at a lower price. And that's, you know, not just for commodities, like I was saying before, for currencies and things of that nature. It makes uh, great sense to for business financial managers to know about derivatives and know how to use them to protect themselves. OK, moving on to the next slide. Types of financial institutions. So these are these are important to know these financial institutions because you may deal with them at some point in your financial life. If you're going to be a finance major or finance concentration, you may be working at one of these companies. So you should really know the basics of these companies. And these companies are what drives the financial markets. Now, investment banks. Most financially oriented graduates want to work in an investment bank. And the, the competition to work in an investment group bank is very high. There is a tremendous amount of competition to get jobs because investment bankers make a lot of money and there's a lot of opportunity to grow within an investment bank you know so investment banks are highly sought after for college graduates to work in but many college graduates don't always fully understand what an investment bank does now one of the big jobs in an investment bank is to organize and help companies raise capital so they um help corporations to figure out if they should do an IPO, design some sort of security or bond that would be attractive to investors. So the investment bank, they have all the expertise, the lawyers, the accountants, the know-how to deal with the government regulation. So the investment bank will buy securities from, from a corporation and then resell them to savers. So investment banks also have a great reach into the other types of institutions and individuals that will buy these stocks and bonds. And when they organize this, the investment bank is, you know, will be called it a underwriter. So they'll underwrite these stocks and bonds and IPOs to help raise initial funds for a lot of companies. Um, so, you know, investment banks have a great amount of power and influence in the growth of corporations and the creation of wealth overall in the economy. And investment banks like Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs, you know, um, they are, you know, powerhouses in this area. So, and so investment banks are complicated. They do a lot of things. Not only do they help raise capital, but they also help facilitate mergers and acquisitions. Um, and a number of other types of services they can provide companies, uh, all with a financial um, aspect to it. Okay, so let's move to commercial banks. And you probably are more familiar with a commercial bank because banks like Bank of America, Citibank, Wells Fargo, uh, Chase, they're all around us. You look around and every um, town in America, there's a bank. And you know, what do these banks do? You're very familiar with these banks do. You can make a savings account or a checking account. It's basically a department store for people who want to save money or people who want to borrow money. A lot of um, commercial banks also offer loans. Um, now, th through, I mean, there's a lot of, you know, if you think about what these commercial banks can offer, auto loans, mortgages, savings accounts, checking accounts, money market accounts. You know, it's pretty uh, standard, but they're sort of the first place people bring their money before moving it elsewhere. So commercial banks have always played a big role in, in most economies. So now we move to financial service corporations. And these are very large companies that combine many different financial institutions under one single uh, corporate umbrella. So most financial service corporations, um, you know, started started in one area, but now how have diversified to cover many different um, functions. So you could have you know these mega banks like Citibank, which is a commercial bank, but it's also an investment bank, a securities broker organization, an insurance company, and a leasing company. So uh, some 
some companies have been quite large, so big that we can't really classify them under one area, so we just call them a financial services corporation. Okay, so let's look at uh, pension funds. Uh, a sub note, though, I should say, when talking about commercial banks, I myself don't really bank with a commercial bank. So I don't have a bank account at Bank of America or anything like that. I deal with what's, what's known as a credit union. So a credit union is a non-for-profit, members-driven um, financial organization that, that works very similar to a bank, but what the difference is that it's non-for-profit. So the credit union can offer mortgages, offer auto loans, savings accounts, certificates of deposits, all, most of the features that a regular bank can offer. But a credit union, since it's non-for-profit, it means that their late rates are typically lower for loans and mortgages, and they pay higher amounts of savings for savings accounts and certificates of deposit. I know the commercial, the credit union I, I use, at the end of the year, if they have excess profits, they usually return it to me as a special dividend for their members. So they think of their members, people who deposit money into their accounts, they are considered a member of the bank, not a customer. So it's a different approach. And typically, you'll, you'll be charged less fees and you'll have, um, it's not a greedy for-profit trying to wring out as much profit from you as possible, like Bank of America, a credit union is a, is a lot more uh, cost effective for the individual who wants to keep most of their money and not have that money wind up as a as net profit for a commercial bank. So if you if you don't know what a credit union is or you're not if, you, if you're not involved in the credit union, you may want to check it out because it could save you a significant amount of money. Okay, so moving on to pension funds. Pension funds are sort of a minority these days. Most companies run 401k accounts, but for some some um, government jobs and some businesses, they still have pension funds, which are basically where employees are, are going to have you work for a company for a certain amount of years. The company is going to invest money for you into a pension fund and then it's going to pay out. Um, it can pay out a certain amount to you during retirement. And a lot of these pension funds can be, can be run by... Um, are going to be a third party who's going to organize and maintain these pension funds for companies. Um, but again, that's becoming a less um, less popular uh, option for businesses because it's expensive because businesses fund these pension funds 100% for the most case where 401ks, they fund at a much lower level. So most companies have already switched to 401ks. Now, uh, let's talk about mutual fund companies. So what is a mutual fund company? Well, it's basically a company that has management that's going to buy stocks or bonds and, and, and organize them for you and use their expertise to get you a better rate than if you were to buy stocks or bonds directly. Well, that's sort of the goal. So mutual funds is where you can bring your savings to and they basically have uh, two types of mutual funds, either a, a managed fund where professional managers will manage your money and try to get you a decent return or they will have unmanaged funds where they just follow, let's say, a stock index. Uh, and mutual funds are, I pretty much everybody knows what they are, they're a pretty popular way of saving and investing. Now, within, um, if we're talking about, you know, saving money, exchange-traded funds are a particular instrument that was created a number of years ago, and these are typically non-managed, uh, highly cost-effective, um, instruments that are similar to mutual funds, but there is no, there's much less overhead and much less management. And certainly most of them don't have any active management, which makes them a lot more efficient uh, to invest in. They're also, unlike mutual funds, which trade, if you buy a mutual fund, you're only going to be priced at the end of the day. And exchange traded funds work more like stocks where they can be priced throughout the day. You can take short positions against them. Uh, so they operate trade more like a stock than a mutual fund. But essentially, the concept of them are similar to mutual funds. You're investing in a group of stock funds. Now, there are also hedge funds, and this sometimes confuses a lot of people. What exactly is a hedge fund? Can I invest in a hedge fund? Well, for most people, you can't invest in a hedge fund because they require 
um, certain minimum amounts, a million dollars is not uncommon as, as a starting point to even get into the hedge fund. So they're really for the one percenters, shall we say. And now they're similar to mutual funds. Uh, they'll accept money from savers and then they'll go and make investments. Uh, but the important difference is where mutual funds are heavily regulated and registered with the SEC and have laws and rules and regulations about what they can and can't do, hedge funds are unregulated. So they can do, take any risks or pretty much do whatever they want within reason of the law um, to make a return for investors. So typically hedge funds have a lot more uh, evolved and sophisticated trading strategies to maximize returns. And like I said, minimum investments, some maybe a million dollars, some $10 million would be involved in the hedge fund. And, but hedge funds have been proven to make a, a significantly higher return than mutual funds because of all the different trading strategies that they can employ to make money, to invest them on behalf of their investors. They have a lot more versatility to uh, trade uh, their investors' money to make a higher return. Okay, and now there's also private equity funds. So private equity funds, these are organizations, they're sort of like they will purchase um, equity into other companies or manage portfolios of other companies. So this is private money, it's not, you know, on, on the stocks markets or anything like that. So a private equity group will go in and buy a bunch of small companies, maybe repackage them as a larger company and resell. So they sort of come in with funding and they get involved with the company and they may buy the company outright. Um, they may work on uh, improving the company, restructuring them and reissuing them as stock. So they can make their investors a lot of money because they have a lot of financial know-how on how to uh, turn companies around. And there's a lot of, you know, um, of these companies, these private equity companies that have taken a number of companies private, such as Dunkin' Donuts, fixed them up and then brought them public again. I think uh, it's, a, you know, it's fairly common uh, for these companies to look for a, a stock or a business in distress, buy it out, take it um, private, fix it up. Um, put better management in and then relaunch it as a public stock again later in life. So it's, it's you know, a very exciting type of company to work for at some point in the uh, future if you're ever looking to work in finance. Okay, moving on, let's move on to stock market transactions. So people, I think these days and age are pretty familiar with um, the stock market and stocks in general. So Apple, at a certain point, we know we know of Apple stock and how exactly do those shares work as far as being traded? Well, if Apple decides to issue stock, they can issue additional stock if they wanted to. They usually want the assistant of investor and investment banker like we talked about before. So they invest Investor purchase some, purchases some newly issued shares, uh, and that, of course, is going to be transacted in the primary market. Uh, it can also be in the secondary market if it's already begun trading. Now, so one type of, so you can think of stock market transactions in two types. You have the primary and secondary market. Most of the volume occurs in the secondary market. Um, so if you want to buy existing shares of Apple, you would have to go to the secondary market, and that's where most people uh, apply for and buy their shares. You know, most of Apple stock, they're not so busy issuing new stock, they're mostly busy buying back uh, their current shares of stock. Now, stock, um, if you think of stock markets, a uh, very, uh, iconic stock market is the New York Stock Exchange, which is a very large stock market and it has their main building in Manhattan. And there's a number of traders on the floor that work, work back and forth to trade um, stocks for people. And you know, so you, the way it works, you have a seat on the exchange and then you can have representation on the exchange and then you can have your traders 
um, in certain brokerage departments to trade, make a market and trade stocks back and forth. And you often, if you watch any financial news, they often will show you clips or some um, people working on the New York Stock Exchange and it looks exciting. There's computerization, there's terminals, there's people in blue jackets running back and forth. And that's like a very physical stock market. Um, there are other different stock markets, you know, you know, the two biggest, of course, the New York, New, New York Stock Exchange and the NASDAQ, which stands for um, National Social Association of Security Dealers Automated Quotation System. Uh, so the physical exchanges uh, are very physical, but a lot of their transactions do take place on computers. But there is an electronic stock market called the, the NASDAQ that we're talking about or the over-the-counter where um, it's a dealer-based market and it works over uh, communication signals. So it's sort of like the internet for trading stocks, the NASDAQ. But the NASDAQ was around um, way before the internet became popular in the public space. And the NASDAQ is where, uh, there, there's a NASDAQ building in Times Square, but it's just a media studio. NASDAQ is really a base set of, of connection of, of computers that make a market to trade stocks back and forth. So those are the two biggest markets for where stocks would be traded. Now, uh, and of course there are stock markets all over the world and stocks are traded you know, all over the world. And the NASDAQ would be considered part of the over-the-counter market. And you know, the over-the-counter market is just a collection of dealers uh, and brokers who connect electronically through computer terminals to make their trades. And they don't need any physical exchanges to make the trade of those stocks. All right, so let's let's talk about what an IPO is, you know, and this I think I think most people have a basic idea of what an IPO is. It's initial public offering. So it occurs when a company wants to go public for the first time. So they want to sell the stock to the public and become a publicly traded company. Uh, so going public is, you know, involved in raising this capital from investors so the company can take this money and rein reinvest it and grow the company. So you get a company like Chipotle Mexican uh, Foods and, or, or better known, Chipotle Mexican Grill, and they go public, they take the money and open up a thousand new locations, greatly increasing the value and the scope of their business. Um, but once you go public, you're highly regulated, you're highly transparent, so there are some drawbacks uh, to going public. You know, the number of new IPOs, they raise and fall every year. So when stock markets are good and, and healthy, you have a lot more number of IPOs. And when stock markets are weaker, less companies do want to go public and they may wait a while before they go public. Uh, you know, it's... And it's always exciting, but unfortunately, for if you want to buy an IPO, you can't buy it in the public, um, direct, primary market. That's already all sewed up by mutual funds, insurance companies, investment banks, and brokerages. So you can buy it the first day it trades in the secondary market, because usually it opens up, say, 929 in the primary market, and all the primary shareholders get their shares. Then 930, it starts trading in the secondary market. But by that point, the, the IPOs jump 20, 30, 50% in one day. So typically, if you wanted to buy a stock the first day it trades, you're paying a hefty premium over what the IPO investors have paid. So it's sort of a little bit like a fixed system, a rigged system, where it, the, it, the investment banks all but guarantee profits for their investors in the IPOs. And there's so much demand at the higher end level, it never really gets to the small guy level, um, the individual uh, shareholder and but every once in a while you know people a lot of companies go public and the more well known the brand is you know like a Google or a Snapchat or an Amazon or Facebook the more in demand typically the IPO will pop up in the first day of trading as more people buy in the secondary market and drive up the price of those uh, initially publicly traded stocks so it's always you know very um, exciting and people like the stock market because of the high amount of returns and gains that you get in the stock market so 
Uh, now, there are definitely ups and downs in the stock market, but overall, in the long term, you have much higher return in the stock market than other places. So if you look here at this, at this slide here, the S&P 500 total return dividend plus dividend yield, capital gain or loss from 68 to 2018, you see that, of course, these blue bars are percentage of returns. So we had some down years. These are recessions in the early 70s. Um, then in 82, we had a recession. Um, in 91, we had a recession. And of course, we had the this right here is three horrible years of stock market returns during the dot-com. We had a dot-com bust. And then we had um, a lot of fraud in the accounting. So these are three horrible years for stocks, followed by... Um, five years of gains, and then the Great Recession, which had um, greater than a 40% decline in stocks. So this is one of the biggest declines in stocks. And typically when we have you know, a 20 or 30% decline, that's more typical for a bear market, a bad bear market. But this was an exceptionally horrible market in 2008, followed by many years of gains in the stock market, where so these returns every so often you could have many years of gains and then you have a, a year of losses. And the stock market sort of regroups, uh, faces the reality and prices get reset. Okay, so let's, let's talk a little bit more about uh, stocks. And you know, stocks have to report their the information. So they're a public company, so they have to report their um, their earnings, their sales, you know, their financial statements are a public record and have to be reported. So when you look for a stock quote, and this is an example of Twitter from, this is Yahoo Finance, where this quote is coming from. Um, and, you know, this is say Twitter, and you can see, if you look at the chart, this is, what's nice about Yahoo is they give you the, a lot of information just on the quote. So you get the, um, opening bid, the opening price, the bid and the ask. Um, you get the, the, the day range for the trading, the 52 week range, the volume, the average volume. So this day volume was much higher than the average. The market cap, so the market is valuing Twitter at 11 billion. The beta, which we'll talk about in later chapters. The PE ratio, earnings per share, estimated target for the stock. So this is all in the summary. And then we get a little, a little graph of the stock prices for Twitter. And you'll see that this is sort of a low point for Twitter here. Now, they do have more statistics and profiles and financials, options, historical data, what analysts are saying. So Yahoo is a great place to look up the quote for a stock. And you know, on this particular day, Twitter was down 4.74%. It's not a particularly great day. For, for Twitter. So um, Twitter uh, hasn't had as much success as say Facebook has in becoming public. Uh, neither has Snapchat. So not all social media companies enjoy the same amount of uh, appreciation in their stock price because there are risks and there are, it is particularly hard for some of these social media companies to translate eyeballs to revenue, ad revenues and not turn away uh, users when you put too many ads on the platform. Okay, so it's interesting how much you know information there really is in the stock market that you could look at and gain some uh, knowledge about. You know, there's so many stocks today to really even talk about, look at, work with. Um, now, as far as stock returns, we're going to talk more closely about stock returns in chapters eight and nine, and this is where we'll talk about you know, how to calculate returns uh, and, and for not individual stocks and portfolios. But let's talk about market efficiency. So, you know, we have the market price. This is the price the stock is currently trading at. You know, um, so when they say market price, they mean current stock price. We have the intrinsic value that we talked about, uh, which is the, the true value the company should be selling at. So this is the value that is based on the realities of the company. Um, and sometimes the intrinsic value does not match the market price. But the equilibrium price would be where 
there's a balance between buy and sell orders at a given time and that means the stock would be at equilibrium and the price should be relatively stable and to some new information is brought to light that would greatly drain, change the scope of what the value of the company is and then the shares will trade more heavily so such as an earnings release so in an efficient market prices should be closer to intrinsic values but sometimes we're not in an efficient market sometimes markets are inefficient so they may be over, well, wildly overvalued such as the dot-com bubble the uh, real estate bubble or the everything bubble where everything is sort of at a highly infl inflated price. Now, so we like it when securities trade at equilibrium or they're fairly priced. That mark that so when stocks are fairly priced, we can go in and buy them with confidence that we're buying them at the right price. Nobody would want to go to a store and pay five dollars for a gallon of milk where the going price for milk is two dollars. You know, so but investors. You know, it's hard for investors to beat the market because the market is a tricky play, a tricky thing, and it takes a lot of experience. But if the market, the more efficient the market is, the better chance investors have. Because when it's inefficient, it can be very um, difficult to really judge where this inefficiency is going to start and where it's going to end. You know. Okay. So what are some um, implications of market efficiency and basically market efficiency is you know supply and demand um, so say there's some new information from the FDA approves uh, a new drug a new medical research is approved if you know if the market is very efficient you can expect that the um, the stock's gonna reflect this new news. So if the new news is good, the stock price should go up, especially for pharmaceuticals. When something's approved, passes FDA approval, the stock price generally goes up greatly, but if it's not approved, it goes down greatly. So you can kind of see the effect of the efficient market through very um, meaningful news, such as what you'd see in, in, in a pharmaceutical type of companies. Um, and you wanna capitalize, of course, on information when things like that change. Um, and there's been a lot of study of efficient markets and there's, you know, we'll talk more about this in later chapters, but and when we talk about, you know, markets, we hope for them to be efficient, but sometimes they can become highly inefficient and we don't realize it until it's too late. But, you know, there have been a number of economists, a number of um, academics have gone into study stock markets and try to figure out when... Um, and the right time to buy is and you know a, a lot of this research has been inconclusive making it very difficult to figure out when to buy and you add in the complexities of this high frequency trading you can get days where the Dow Jones Industrial Average drops 800 points a thousand points but then a few days later it comes back and there can be this real uh, high amount of volatility that can create a lot of anxiety uh, in the markets for people and the, the, why do we have this inconsistency you, you could say and a lot of it has to do with humans humans are have certain behaviors and that impacts the market efficiency so because we don't think like machines because we have emotions we can sometimes get carried away with buying a stock and driving the prices up to 2000 and sometimes you know when a stock is priced too low we may not like it because the price is falling, even though it's undervalued, it's just not in fashion. So we might shy away from it and push the stock down even lower. So there's really extremes can, can occur because of human biases and human emotions in the stock market that fear and greed are two big emotions in the stock market. And there's a whole area of research called behavioral finance where people go in and they look for insights on psychology and try to understand investors and how they make irrational decisions and how they, their, their valuation process, how they interpret new data. And it always seems to be like a new generation of stockholders and stock buyers come into the market that didn't learn the lessons that the previous generation may have known and destined to repeat the same mistakes that occur. And you know this, you know, this efficient market hypothesis that they've come up with 
that suggests that stock prices should be efficiently um, priced at all times is a lot of times behavioral finance can poke holes in that because they find a number of research that you know directly shows that you know people and just the uh, appearance of bubbles in the stock market like the dot-com bubble was just ridiculous in the price and the PE valuation of stocks that people thought were the correct price for stocks only to see those prices you know crater 80% on some of these stocks just a few months uh, later so this overconfidence that people sometimes get and this is what's bad when you have a long bull market people get overconfident and they, they seem like, you know, that they start to believe their own hype, that they can't, that it's hard for them to make mistakes. They really know something better than other people. And they're just really good at making money in the stock market. And the truth is, no, you're not really good at making money in the stock market. It's just that everyone is, all the stocks are going up and everybody's making money. So it's very easy to make money in the stock market. But it could put you in to give you too much overconfidence and take too much risk on and really set yourself up to be highly exposed if there's a stock market crash but that's sort of just human tendencies so you know when you have this when people seem to be greedy when stock markets are going up and they don't want to miss out and they want to get in there and trade stocks and be, a, be have skin in the game and and they get you know into positions that are leveraged on margin and then the, the market collapses and it basically their money is destroyed so uh, and then you, get, then you get fear. So once people see the stock market's going down and they're scared and they're worried, they don't want to see their shrinking portfolios shrink anymore and they sell close to the bottom of the market at the worst time possible. You know, so human behavior can be counted on to, can be complete, to make the same mistakes over and over. And that's what sort of muddles the efficiency of the stock markets. Perhaps in the future, we'll just let machines trade for us in the stock market and there will be no human involvement. We'll just put all our money in, in AI and machines can trade stocks based on all the known information. And we'll have a much more calm and realistic stock market. I don't think that's happening anytime soon. I'm pretty sure driverless cars will be a fact of life long before 100% computerized trading with limited human involvement will be achieved. But anyway, on that note, that is the end of chapter two. I hope you enjoyed the discussion and I look forward to talking to you again real soon. Thank you.